Welcome to the Las Vegas Sports Services NBA Weekly Report. I'm John Cranton in Las Vegas, joined by Jeff Sod of LVSS. We're going to take a look at the NBA Central Division. We have some trivia, some trends, some road trips coming up for the NBA to keep in mind from a Vegas betting standpoint. But first, Jeff, you're off that terrific February, and you're still rolling along another 3-0 and night in the NBA on Wednesday, part of a sizzling 89-61 and 61 run with all plays, both college and pro. Uh, what do you have on tap for how people uh, can get aboard? Well, I'm on a 38-22 and one run in the NBA, 14-6 and six with my best bets. College basketball, 51-39-1, and 11-5 and with my 20-star consensus plays. So uh, things just keep getting better at LVSS. And now I'm going to give you three weeks of NBA and college basketball. That will include my NBA blowout game of the year on Friday, plus my tournament game of the year. You get all that for just a total of $10. Just call LVSS at one 575 8916 Get three weeks of NBA and college, including my NBA college blowout game of the year, and my tournament game of the year, all just $10, 1-866-575-8916. All right, that's three weeks' worth of action from a Vegas pro, just 10 bucks, including that NBA blowout game of the year Friday, and Jeff has been on a red-hot run since the first week of February, so make sure you take advantage. All right, uh, let's take a look first at some teams, Jeff, that are, well, they're on streaks right now, uh, spread trends, uh, but the question is, are those trends for real or just a bit of an anomaly? I'm going to start with the Portland Trailblazers um, coming into the end of this week, the 6-0 and spread run, very good. However, I think that's a bit misleading, and I don't expect uh, this to continue. Well, first of all, the Blazers are close to a 500 team, and they're not far from the final eight spot in the West. So they do have that motivation. However, I don't see this team making the playoffs. they got a lot of flaws on the team. Uh, 28th defensively, allowing over 46% shooting. So they're one of the worst defensive teams uh, in the NBA. Offense is 16th in points scored. The defense is 21st in points allowed, and they're 19th in rebounding. So there's a ton of weaknesses. They did cover at the Memphis Grizzlies the other night in a close loss. But when you take a close look at what happened, it really was misleading. They only shot 40% from the field. They got destroyed on the glass, 52-38. to 38. They missed 11 free throws, and they collapsed in the fourth quarter. So I can see this team struggling down the stretch, falling more and more out of it, any chance to get into the playoffs, and just, you know, not being that interested in playing that hard. And keep in mind, they're starting a stretch. The Blazers are playing 8 of 11 road games, so there's a lot of things that are conspiring against Portland. I think that would be a go-against team uh, over the next month. I agree with you with the Blazers. Uh, they're not really that good. Uh, they have some good young players there, but uh, they're not going to go anywhere this season. Uh, another team is the Miami Heat. They're streaking. They uh, one, they're 16 and 0 straight up, 10 and 6 against the spread. One thing you have to remember about this, about, about these kind of things, the line keeps going up and up. And just because it's streaking, you have to make sure you don't lay too many points. As we saw on Wednesday, the Heat were uh, 50, 15 and a half point favorites with the Magic, and the Miami was very lucky to win that game. So even though a team is streaking, if the line just keeps getting too high, you might have to lay off that game and uh, just be careful uh, because you know you, you can lose in the NBA in any given night. Exactly. Uh, another team to keep an eye on uh, with respect to totals, Minnesota Timberwolves, 9-3 and three run under the total. Is that something that's going to continue? Yeah, I can see that continuing for uh, several reasons. One is that the offense has really slipped badly of late. They went six straight games recently scoring under 100 points. And when you take that a step further, they played Miami, Washington, and the Phoenix Suns. Scored just 81, 83, and 87 points in those games. you got no Kevin Love. you got a team that is now... Well, they can't shoot. They've slipped to 28th in the NBA in field goal shooting. They're 20th in points scored, so offense is really a major problem for the Timberwolves. So I wouldn't be surprised to see uh, this team be very good as a look at under the total in certain situations. Also, the Phoenix Suns, we talked about them in, in recent weeks on this show. Uh, another team I think should be a goal against the rest of the season. They had a recent three-game winning streak, but then they lost 98-71 to at home to Toronto. In that game, the Suns had 29 turnovers. Uh, Marcin Gortat, he's out for the season probably with an injured foot. Uh, uh, Garan Dragic, he has a sore back. Uh, Jermaine O'Neal is going to be out a couple of games for personal reasons. Uh, opposing teams are shooting 38% from the three-point line against the Suns. Uh, even Michael Beasley admitted that the team just doesn't play well together. Uh, so um, there's another team to go against the rest of the season, at least to be careful with the rest of the year is the Phoenix Suns, John. 
Did you say 29 turnovers in one game? Yes, I mean, and, and at home against a team that was on that, that's been on a losing streak. I mean, the Suns are just a team waiting for the season to end to get to that lottery pick. That's that's pretty much the way it is there. Well, that that 29 turnover game. Were you bringing the ball up in the backcourt? Is that what happened? No, if I, if I was doing it, it wouldn't be 29 turnovers. It would be a lot better than that. <laughs> Uh, another team to keep in mind as far as totals, which I like to look at, would be uh, the Sacramento Kings. Here's a team that's been on a recent 10-3 and three run over the total. Now, let's examine why that is. Well, their offense is actually pretty good. 13th in the NBA in points scored. Uh, they have Tariq, Tariq Evans, the young guard. His rookie contract is ending soon, so he's a very good young player, and he certainly has motivation uh, to, to pad his offensive numbers and keep them going as one of the better offensive teams. Then you flip it around for a moment. This team is playing no defense. They're 30th in the NBA in points allowed, giving up 105 points per game. So you combine all those things, no interest at all in playing defense, and pretty good offensive team. No surprising that they're on a 10-3 and run over the total, and I can see that uh, continuing. When also, as far as field goal shooting defense, only the Cleveland Cavaliers are worth worth. Worse, the Kings allow 47% shooting from the field. So every way you slice this team, absolutely no defense from Sacramento. So I can see them continuing to be a good team to look at over the total. And the Atlanta Hawks are on a 7-3 against the spread the last 10 games. They won the first three of a six-game road trip. Then they lost the last three before beating the, the uh, Wolfo 76ers. Al Horford is finally healthy after nagging injuries last year and a half. Uh, he and Josh Smith uh, lead the team in scoring at 17 points per game. Horford is averaging 24 points, 11 rebounds his last 11 games. Uh, the Hawks are 11-16-2 against the spread at home. Much better against number on the road, 17-14. Cal Corver is hitting 46% from the three-point line. Right now, the Hawks are playing the best they have all season, and uh, they're in good shape. Right now, they're in fifth place in the Eastern Conference. They have a chance to uh, maybe go, oh, no, I'm not sure, deep in the playoffs, maybe the second round in the playoffs. But right now, the Hawks are a team to maybe look at to uh, put some money on, John. Okay, let's take a look at the uh, NBA Central Division. You might want to call this uh, the defensive division. you got the Pacers and the Bulls, great defensive teams. you got the Bucks, are roughly a 500 team. And then there's the bottom feeders with the Pistons and the Cavaliers. Uh, what are the prospects for, say, one of some of the teams uh, in this division, Jeff? Well, uh, Chicago Bulls. Number three in the East, but uh, I don't see them doing much in the playoffs. Uh, their offense sometimes looks absolutely terrible. They're 9-22 and against the spread in the, in the, the last 31 home games. 7-20 and against the spread in the last 27 versus the Western Conference. Their offense just seems so bad at times. They'll bounce back with a great game, but then they'll revert to that form at home, especially at home. That, for some reason, they don't play well at home, and, uh, the, and they just can't, they just can't get, uh, put some points on the board. So right now, uh, the Bulls... I'm not, I don't have any, you know, Derek Rose is out. It doesn't look like he's going to come back. If he, right now, he's, they say he's healthy, but he's not really ready for uh, to, to play yet. So I'm, I'm not, I would not go with the Bulls right now, even uh, during the regular season, let alone the playoffs, John. Well, the Indiana Pacers are the team that I would look at to uh, beat in that division. Uh, just They also have an injury like the uh, Bulls, although it's not as severe. It's Danny Granger, again, has some knee problems. But there's tremendous depth and flexibility with this team. David West and Roy Hibbert crashing the boards, the terrific backcourt, with Paul George and George Hill leading in scoring. This team is focuses fantastically on defense uh, for this coach, Frank Vogel. Vogel. They're number one in the NBA in rebounds, and they're second in points allowed, and that keeps them competitive in every game. Uh, it's going to be a fascinating team uh, to watch in the postseason. They had that collapse last year against Miami where they were up two games to one and really fell apart and took some criticism from their fans and even their general manager. So i got to believe they're going to be a team with a chip on their shoulder come playoffs. And they've been a phenomenal bounce-back team this season. When the Indiana Pacers lose a game, uh, they come back and they're 14-3 and three against the spread the next game. And then as far as spread trends to the totals, it's just what you'd imagine under the total. Uh, when they face a team with a winning percentage below 40%, meaning a bad team, 13-3 and three under the total. They can dominate those bad teams, shut them down offensively. And in the Eastern Conference, they really get up to play against teams in the Eastern Conference defensively, 25-12-1 under the total. Uh, so a lot of trends to look at from what I think is a very good Indiana team that is going to be a factor right through into the postseason, Jeff. And the Milwaukee Bucks, uh, the Bucks are going to make the playoffs thanks to a recent five-game uh, 
slide by the Raptors. The first eight teams in the Eastern Conference are pretty much set right now. Uh, the Bucks have three solid guards, uh, Monte Ellis, Brandon Jennings, and J.J. Redick. Uh, the center, Larry Sanders, leads the league in blocks. They could have some rebounding problems, though. They were out rebounded 42-34 uh, to 34 and lost to the Clippers on Wednesday night. Once again, another home team, another team that doesn't cover well on the road. The Bucks are 11 and 19 against the spread at home, 7 and 12 against the spread away. Uh, but basically, the Bucks are a 500 team, and I think they'll probably be one and done in the playoffs, Jim. Well, we got two teams left uh, in that division: the Pistons and the Cavaliers. Let's let's split up these bottom feeders. I'll start uh, with the Pistons. They're not going to make the playoffs, and they're not going to be covering games either because. They won their very first game in February, and then after that, that was a win over the Cavaliers. They went 5-8 and eight straight up and against the spread the rest of February. We're very glad to get that month over with. During that stretch, they were favored three times, lost two of them straight up. They were a six-point favorite over New Orleans at home, got blown out 105-86. to 86. Just not a lot to like about this team. They're 21st in the NBA in scoring. Keep in mind, they're the third worst free throw shooting team in the league, 69%. Need those late covers uh, at the free throw line, and they're certainly not a team that's going to get that for you. They traded away one of their fan favorites, Tayshawn Prince, one of the few remaining players uh, from their championship year. And keep in mind that this starts, uh, they're, they're in the middle, actually, of a terrible scheduling stretch since the end of February Right through to April 6th, they'll be playing 13 of 18 games on the road. Also, when they play a team with a winning record, 7-19 and 19 against the spread. When they play a team from the powerful Western Conference, how about 2-10 and 10 against the spread? Looks like a good go-against team, uh, Jeff, down the stretch. Yeah, they've been a go-against team for some time now. And the Cavaliers, another one, uh, Kyrie Irving has missed some games with a knee injury, and now he's got a stomach virus. And, and a couple other players on the team also uh, are, have some kind of illness, so you might be careful with the Cavaliers the next few days. Uh, Cleveland, not a good defensive team. They allow almost 48% from the field. Uh, they blew a 22-point lead against the Knicks on, on Monday, then they came back and beat Utah. Uh, they've had a lot of injuries, but still, they, this team just doesn't seem to be improving uh, very fast. I think they're still a couple years away from being in the playoffs. The one thing, one thing that's worked out for them was that trade with Memphis. Uh, Wayne Ellington and, uh, and uh, Maurice Spates have, have made some major contributions to this team. But right now, the Cavaliers would be a team to be really careful with, John. Okay, let's look at um, some trends to keep in mind with respect to scheduling over the next few weeks. The Miami Heat, the defending champs, 9 of 11 on the road beginning March 13th. The miserable Orlando Magic, 10 of 12 on the road starting March 16th. And the Chicago Bulls have a three-game road trip, but it is out west, so they'll be changing some time zones. And then the Brooklyn Nets, 10 of 12 games on the road. All right, it's trivia time, Jeff. And with uh, March coming up, we might as well talk about a little bit of uh, NCAA title games. What is the most uh, surprising winner that you can remember in NCAA title game history? Well, first we have the 1966 game when uh, Texas Western, which is now Utah, uh, started five black, black players for the first time and beat an all-white team for the first time. That was that was a big surprise. But the point spread in that game was only six and a half, so it wasn't a huge upset. We had 1999. Uh, UConn was nine and a half point dogs against Duke. Uh, Although they won, but it wasn't, as I recall, it wasn't considered to be a huge upset because UConn was number one in, in, in a lot of the polls for much of that season. The biggest upset, I think, for, most people would agree on would be 1985 when uh, Villanova, plus nine points against Georgetown, came out of nowhere. They weren't, they, Villanova was not even ranked in the top 20 uh, going into the tournament. They shot 78 or 6 percent in the title game, beat Georgetown with Pat Ewing, and uh, that, that's probably... I would say the consensus pick for the biggest surprise in uh, NCAA title game history, John. I would second that one, and I'm going to throw one in that probably a lot of people might not recall. 1957 championship game, you had number one North Carolina as a three-point underdog to Kansas, and the reason was Kansas was playing within the their vicinity in Kansas City, uh, but also they had Will Chamberlain. Uh, and uh, the game ended up going triple overtime. North Carolina had just played a triple overtime game in the Final Four, and this title game went triple overtime. And uh, can you guess what the final score would be after the triple overtime? It was in the 50s, I think. I think I know I, these, uh, they were just trying to keep the ball away from Will Chamberlain, so they held the ball. And uh, I, it was a low scoring. For, for, for three overtime game, I remember it was very low scoring. I think it was in the 50s. Yeah, you're correct. Many correct? people would say probably 80 to 75. No, it was 54 to 53. The first overtime, oh, okay. each team scored exactly two points. The second overtime, there was yeah. no scoring at all. And then the third overtime was 6 to 5 in favor of North Carolina. So they won the game by a point uh, and 
covered as an underdog in that game. And just for uh, for measurement here, Will Chamberlain was 6 of 13 shooting, 23 points, and he was 11 of 16 from the free throw line. Highly unlike uh, Wilt, but he had a, a pretty solid all-around game. And also of note is the opening uh, tip in the game, Frank McGuire, the North Carolina coach, sent out a 5'11 guard to do the jump ball with the seven foot one Will Chamberlain. He said that was a psychological ploy. And then they rushed back and played zone, and he said, I wanted to show them that I was playing zone. Uh, okay, it well, it took uh, 30 years to get the shot clock in. You, you would think after that game they would say, we need to do something, but it took them until 1986 to finally get the, the shot clock in. Exactly. Uh, okay, that'll do it for this report. Jeff, tell, tell everybody about that hot streak you've been on and the big play you have uh, coming up Friday. 38-22 in the NBA, and I have my blowout game of the year going on Friday. you got to get three weeks of NBA and college basketball. That will also include my tournament game of the year, all for a total of just $10. Just call LVSS at 1-866-575-8916. All right, very good. And Jeff and I will be back next Friday for another Las Vegas Sports Services NBA report. Good luck, and we'll see you then.